coming up. Is this something that the competition commissioner should be looking into? There's five of you here today, but there is no competition. So what is preventing one of you from saying, you know what, our travel card is going to be, let's pick a number, 12%. What's stopping you from doing that? Anybody. There's more work. We're clearing a million dollars. You had individuals clearing a million dollars through a bank account in one day and then taking it back out and laundering it. Like there were absolutely no internal compliance measures on that that would check for that regardless of what the regulation is. This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Some of, one of the stats that I got was that Interact reported in 2022 alone 1.7 billion e-transfers. So when you think about the profit, even on a low volume rate, um, and then combine it with the profit that your banks might be making off of it, and I'm a conservative, I'm all for profit, but given that per your admission, Interact is the dominant player in this, do you not think that this committee should be recommending that the competition commissioner looked at per year admission, a volume-based pricing uh, schedule for e-transfers that might price A, competitors out of the market, and B, might have a detrimental impact on smaller financial institutions. E-transfer is a very innovative payment mechanism, and uh, as Canadians, we're all proud of what uh, Interac has managed to do, and this has been one of the first payment mechanisms globally to introduce person-to-person -person transfers. And I think uh, Interac would be taking the right commercial decisions and over time uh, introducing efficiencies into this market. I rest my case. Thank you, Chair. I think somebody said that uh, interchange fee, you know, we are, is not set up by the banks, it's set up by the credit card companies. So. As bankers, I want to ask every one of you, uh, do you have any, so you, I guess you don't have any objection if we cap the interchange fee at say 0.3% as done by Australia or 0.5% as done by European Union. Uh, since nobody's answering, maybe I should go back again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Douglas, sorry, you're number one on my list, so you have to answer it. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, first of all, thank, thank you for the question. Um, the, um, those other markets are quite different from Canada, so that's number one. Um, and I don't want to speak in hypotheticals, um, scenarios, if, if things are capped. But what I can tell you is that the credit card business is a very complex business and a very expensive business to run. All of you are within a percentage point of each other. When I looked at what your various travel cards are worth, every single one of you was 20.99%. And when you look historically, there was a, a gap between credit card rates and interest rates that was 2% in the 80s. It was only 2%. Do you guys know what that gap is today? RBC maybe. Do you know what that is? Do you know what the gap is today between uh, your, your, your high interest rate cards and what the, what the going interest rate is today? Uh, on remember, I would uh, characterize, I mean, the prime rate uh, today is 5.95%, but I would characterize this as, um, you know, in terms of the, the benefits that the customers get, there are a variety of benefits. Just the number, benefits, just the number the please. What's that on. percentage? What, what's the difference in percentage between the two? 6 and 20, you mean? Um, yeah, it's about 14%, which takes into account all the different costs and all the different benefits that we just went through. With, with your 20.99% card, okay, what's the gap between that card and the prime interest rate? What's that gap? Can you, do you know what the number is? You know, it, it, it's based on the type of card and the type of rate. Um, I know, and I'm members. asking you specifically so about the 20.99% rate on your travel card. Because that's the most popular card that most people would get would be the travel card. So that's a pretty common one. Just about everybody has one. So what's the difference in the interest rate on that travel card and what the prime rate is for interest? Oh, and remember, I think we would be uh, you know, simplifying the business model greatly by just comparing the prime rate and uh, the interest rate charged on a card. 
because so many factors go into defining that business model. If you mean if it's a simple mathematical calculation, it is 20.99 minus 6, 5.95. It's about 15%. But that doesn't okay, take Okay, so there we go. Account. Thank you. I appreciate that. The reason why I'm saying that is because, again, when you compare all of the different cards that everybody offers, it's, it's all the exact same. The, the differences between each and every single card that's out there is basically it's basically nothing. The only difference that is going to come down to a consumer is who are you already doing your day to day banking with? And that's generally who people are going to get their cards from. Sometimes people will vary from or they'll go to a different institution, but it simplifies making your payments if you're at the same bank. So really, at the end of the day, I've heard a lot of you talk about the different choices and the great options that are out there. It's all the exact same. Like what? What? Like. There, there is no real incentive to, to choose between all the different different cards. Like, there's the competition is actually quite false. There's lots of you, there's five of you here today, but there is no competition. So what is preventing one of you from saying, you know what, our travel card is going to be, let's pick number 12%. What's stopping you from doing that? Anybody? Uh, let's go with, uh, let's go with RBC. Back to RBC. We would have to, uh, like I said uh, earlier on, remember, it is a complex business model and it will be simplifying it too great by just uh, taking a, a particular interest rate and saying why not. It's like I said, the benefits to customers are varied. Uh, the choice given to them is varied. And the costs associated with those choices are varied. So there will have to be differential interest rates and differential costs in the marketplace which we provide. And there's a choice to the customer and the value and convenience that we provide um, befits that choice and it's fit for purpose. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to ask, uh, I'm just going to pick one other one here. Let's just say uh, TD. Let's just, I want to extend the same question to you. What is stopping you from offering, say, 12% on your travel card, given that all the different random perks and benefits that all the different cards have are virtually identical? What, would, what is stopping you from just saying, you know what, to get more people on our card, we're going to go 12% instead of 20%. What's stopping you from doing that? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think as an issuer of credit cards, we're, we're designing products that resonate with Canadian customers and meet their needs and expectations. And I would say that it's a highly competitive market in Canada, so it would be expected that offerings would be similar. Um, and the benefits and rewards offerings are, are an example of an opportunity we have to differentiate amongst each other. Thanks. Merci, Mr. Pads. One of the witnesses earlier, and I can't remember which one, said it was an expensive business that you run. I'm sort of interested in understanding extending credit to your customers is certainly a, a service, um, but I want to know how profitable it is for each one of you. Could each one of you remark on what the profit is that your financial institution makes uh, off offering credit card services to your, to your clients? So I'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Douglas from Bank of Montreal. Hi, thank you very much for the question. Um, as you know, we um, have quarterly results that are public, and uh, BMO doesn't actually report credit card profitability d down to that granular level, so I wouldn't be okay, able Ms. to... Okay, Ms. Douglas, I'm, I'm not going to let you go on. If you don't have an answer, I want to move on because I have limited time, so I don't mean to be disrespectful, but Ms. Fur Ms. Furry from CIBC. Thank you for the question. Uh, revenue and net income from our credit card businesses are included in total revenue and net income for our personal and business banking business unit. It is not individually disclosed, which is consistent. Okay, so no breakdown is, is provided. Mr. Suromani, how about you for RBC? Is it the same answer? If it is, we'll just move on. Yes, on remember, it is the same answer. Uh, Mr. McDonald? Or yes, on remember, it is the same answer. And Ms. McKee? Yes, same answer. Okay, so nobody knows how much money they make or is, are not willing to disclose how much money you make off your credit card services, which is more the truth, I would say. So, but it is highly profitable, is it not? Would uh, I'm going to assume that the answer is yes. Uh, Mr. Perkins, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm going to start in order. Uh, when I worked. When I worked at a bank on Bay and King, uh, the, 
The primary big measure, the starting point measure for performance of everyone's performance individually and collectively as employees was the overall return on equity. What's the return on equity target for the Bank of Montreal this year? Hello? Hi there. Um, I believe our our year-to-date return on equity or from the last results was 10.7%. Okay, I'll go to the CIBC. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't think I'm able to comment on the target for our return on equity. Um, our actual return on equity would be similar to what Jennifer Douglas just indicated. Actually, no, it isn't. It was 16.3% last quarter. Sorry, 13.3%. Uh, I'll go to the Royal Bank. Only remember we target about 16%. 16%. And TD. I don't have the exact number. Um, at my fingertips, apologies. It's a fundamental measure that you guys are all judged on. It hasn't changed in the history of the banks. So uh, I won't ask you to divulge the profit that you make or the profit margin. I get it that you want to be secretive of that at credit cards. You each run your credit card divisions. What's the return on equity, the profit per shareholder, the return on equity percentage you make on your credit card business? Bank of Montreal? I'm sorry, can you clarify the question? You have a return on equity measure for your overall profitability of your credit card business. What is it? From a credit card perspective, we don't disclose down to that granular uh, level, as I mentioned before. And CIBC? Yes, we don't disclose um, okay. an ROE. I, I expect it as much. I can tell you, when I worked at a major bank, it was 52%. It wasn't 10, the overall bank, it was 52% was the credit card return on equity internally. So this line that you're not making any money, at a 1.6% credit card loss rate, according to the Canadian Bankers Association, relative to say 1 or 100 basis points generally for your lending, is, is a fantasy. And that difference between all of you, between a 1.6% credit card loss <coughs> and charging 21% interest on the credit card is a monstrous profit uh, decision. And it isn't a few bells and whistles on buying points from Air Canada or Aeroplan or Avion's own internal. So I will move on uh, to TD. TD, um, can you tell me uh, your regulatory failing in the U.S. on money laundering is that, was that a result of the regulator, a result that you guys do the ma bare minimum in money laundering? You don't absolutely <coughs> say, I'm going to stop this no matter what. Is that correct? Thank you for the question. Um, I will say that money laundering is a serious global threat, and our U.S. operation did not maintain an adequate AML program to thwart some criminal activity, and we've taken full responsibility for the failures. And you know that for and a certainty that that can't happen in Canada? We are learning um, from the um, programs that we're putting into place uh, from the U.S., and our AML program is getting stronger every day. So what are the regulatory failings in Canada that, since you're only meeting the regulatory minimums, what are the regulatory fa failings in Canada that would lead to the type of money laundering that went in the United States? The, our U.S. AML program was not sufficient to address the risk aligned to our business activity. Um, we've enhanced governance and controls. We've invested in new talent, training, process redesign, technology, implementation, revised policies and procedures. There's more work We're clearing a million dollars. You had individuals clearing a million priority. dollars through a bank account in one day and then taking it back out and laundering it. Like there were absolutely no internal compliance measures on that that would check for that regardless of what the regulation is? Leadership of our USAML team have the necessary expertise. They're focused on this critical work to enhance our program. Significant work is underway to meet our obligations. What about in Canada? Strengthening our governance and structure, 
improving our policy, risk assessment, enhancements to process and controls, and investment okay. in technology. See, I, I know you're reading the prepared notes by your PR division. RBC, RBC and uh, uh, I'll start with RBC. Uh, would what happened to TD in the U.S. happen to you? Uh, Honorary Member, Mr. Perkins, we are committed to actively maintaining and continuously investing in an effective uh, AML program uh, enterprise-wide to detect, deter, and improve upon what we do. Uh, this is among our highest priorities. You know, financial crimes are. So I'll take that as a yes or no. We work with regulators. Yes, yes or we're no. Working very hard. You're working hard, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen to you. Why is it that the banks, and I'll go to perhaps uh, CIBC, why is it that the banks don't take uh, uh, the initiative themselves to go higher than what the regulator says and say, we're not going to let this happen at all, regardless of what the regulator says? Because it appears to me all that the banks do is the bare minimum. So I, that's to CIBC first. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, CIBC has a very strong um, and comprehensive AML program. Um, we do transactions the notes from TD? on all of our cards. All are those the notes from TD or am I looking at the screen wrong? Because they sound exactly the same. Very strong AML program. So much so that people in TD were allowed to and encouraging, the employees were encouraging people to exchange a million dollars a day going in and out of a bank account and thought this was great. Uh, there's something wrong with all of your compliance measures. And I can't imagine that it doesn't exist here in Canada to the same extent. I, a quick yes or no. I'll start at the top. Bank of Montreal, can this happen to you in Canada, yes or no? We follow regulatory compliance very strongly, especially AML. So I take it that's a maybe. How about on CIBC, we know you were reading the TD notes, so that's a maybe as well. Royal Bank? Only remember, we are actively and maintaining and investing continually. In Scotia Bank, are you a maybe too? Yeah, I, I want a yes or no yeah. on we're the money laundering in Canada. We take AML very seriously. We t we're making con you know, considerable investments in AML all the time. No and we all sure. know that TD has already failed in the U.S., and that doesn't mean that they've got anything in place in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Perkins.